So welcome everyone and thank you for joining the College of Business Administration at Loyola Marymount University for our webinar series, Impact Insights. My name is Nola Wanta and I am the Senior Director of Business Development and Strategy. Our Impact Insights webinar series provides informational content to help organizations thrive and establish new norms during the COVID pandemic. As we continue to observe changes in various sectors, we will continue to bring you valuable knowledge and insights and do our part to create a stronger Los Angeles and beyond. This series is aligned with our mission to advance knowledge and develop business leaders with moral courage and creative confidence to be a force for good for the Los Angeles and global community. But before we get started, I'd like to just quickly go over some of our webinar guidelines. Um, for those of you who may have questions, either during or after the presentation, um, please do type them in the Q&A window. Our speaker will address questions as they come up, so feel free to type them in as they come to mind. Um, we will also leave some time at the end of um, the presentation for an interactive Q&A. So um, in addition to using the Q&A box, please feel free to raise your hand and we will unmute you. And as a friendly reminder that this webinar is being recorded and will be available after the presentation. So with that, I'd like to now welcome our Dean for the College of Business Administration, Dean Dale Smith, who will introduce today's speaker. Thank you, Nola. We are so pleased to have our very own LMU MBA, Kieran Rousey, return to speak with us today about how to unlock your team's potential. Kieran is the world's number one expert on the Evolved team as she was featured in Inc. Magazine, Entrepreneur Magazine, Forbes, and Success. She has a proven track record of developing high-performing organizations, those HPOs that grow profit and revenue. And as you'll see in today's presentation, Kieran's also highly personable, a visionary, innovative, and truly a results-oriented leader. Her work as a chief technology officer and a transformational digital leader has helped executives solve some of the most critical and strategic challenges facing companies today. As a certified coach and a strategy advisor and certified in change management expertise, she's delivered undeniable results transforming leaders, teams, and organizations for clients such as Apple, Google, Target, Ritz-Carlton, Zappos, Amazon, and others. And I even know personally that Kieran's been able to share her best practice thinking in a way that has helped me and the CBA get insights as we manage our teams here in this new virtual world. So we are so pleased to have Kieran join us today to share her expertise with us. Without further ado, over to you, Kieran. Thank you so much, Dale. It's a pleasure and honor to be back with everybody tonight. I appreciate your spending the evening with us and uh, we'll go ahead and jump into the content. So what it is that I do in a nutshell is I help leaders, teams, and organizations reach extraordinary performance and profitability. How do I do that? And why is it important? I will skip through the bios since we've already gone through that information. So why is this kind of work important and how does it benefit leaders, teams, and organizations? Um, from a soft skills perspective, when you're putting in effort, time, and intentionality into building advanced coaching skills for leaders and better team rituals and practices that help them unite around shared purpose and vision, and to cultivate a culture of coaching within your organization, um, not only develops more purposeful, um, more visionary, more resilient, and adaptive leaders and teams, and organizations, but it has impact to the bottom line as well. Um, the kind of work that I do as a coach for leaders directly can help them increase profits by two and a half times. The work that I do specifically with teams to unlock their full potential can help increase your operating profit margins, in some cases up to three times. And organizations that I work with from a bottom line perspective can see three to five times increase in profit. So not only do you have incentive to invest in your talent, your leadership talent and your teams from a soft skill perspective, there is financial incentive to investing in these areas of development for your organization as well. So let's look at how things have kind of shifted um, and how to sort of harness 
harness the power of collective vision, purpose, intelligence, creativity, and imagination within your organization, and how decision making for leaders and teams have shifted um, over the course of the last decade or so. Um, in my observation, you know, we've gone from a fairly hierarchical traditional business organization in which decisions are made by a very select group of leaders kind of in a black box. And they drive that decision making down throughout the rest of the organization. It's kind of a get on board. Um, we don't care whether or not you like it. This is what we're doing. What's shifted in the last decade or so is we're seeing more cross-functional teams that require skills and competencies of leaders that not just one person can possess. So we're looking at leadership teams that are much more cross-functional in nature, making decisions more, more broadly across the organization in a way that is more collaborative and co-creation based and that involve all layers of the organization. So they're not just making decisions and pushing that down a more hierarchical way throughout the organization, but they're building consensus, building shared understanding and building a shared vision throughout all areas of the organization. How they're able to do that is through techniques like appreciative inquiry, changing how these critical conversations are approached, asking the right questions of the right people within the organization, and putting organizational emphasis on rewarding the kinds of team behaviors and outcomes or creating the kind of culture that you ultimately need for your organization to thrive. So what does it take for a leadership team to operate in their genius zone, as I like to call it, and truly thrive? A couple key things. Leadership being focused on collective results I can't tell you how many teams that I start working with initially, C-suite at the VP level and below, who are really uh, lacking alignment, not just strategically, but alignment in the, the driving um, sort of objectives and goals of the organization. So focusing on collective results, their willingness and ability to confront difficult issues, to force clarity on decision-making and a willingness to go first. In essence, courageous leadership and a high level of trust. What else? Teams? Same principles, a high level of trust, searching or mining for that healthy conflict, a commitment to decision making, accountability, and again, a focus on collective results. And how do you get that? You get that through creating psychological safety. Um, this idea of teams and leaders needing to feel safe enough in order to express their, their point of view um, and to go through the sometimes uncomfortable or somewhat painful process of getting alignment and building consensus or shared understanding. <clears throat> so this, this is interesting, and I say this anytime that we enter a group or a Zoom room, as it were now, we're always asking ourselves subconsciously, can I be myself and can I fit in? So your job as a leader in many cases, virtually or otherwise, is to make sure that you're creating enough psychological safety in the space for people to be themselves and to fit in and to feel safe being able to share you know, their ideas or dissenting views. Strength-based leadership. I think this is really important um, and kind of the cornerstone of my experience, at least in the executive MBA program here at LMU. Understanding the talent that you have, the makeup of a talent um, and leveraging your team's strengths and le le leveraging individual strengths to create something that you otherwise couldn't individually. And then a high level of social and emotional intelligence. Those things are still key. Um, grooming for that involves, you know, allowing young and up and coming talent to be a part of the conversation and to be a part of the team uh, rituals and practices and leadership meetings to be able to observe what good looks like and to have an opportunity to participate. So as you're thinking about kind of how to unlock your team's genius and how to create these kinds of settings for your organization, be thinking about who on your team in your different divisions where you can put up and coming talent as an opportunity to sort of observe from um, the more senior tenured folks. 
couple recommendations on powerful questions and safe actions. Um, I get asked a lot from leaders, well, how do I create that psychological safety that's necessary? Are there words or phrases or terms or things that I should stay away from um, or things that I should do or say that would help kind of foster that, um, that environment of trust and safety? And so I've put some um, kind of ones that I would recommend um, and ones that I would also recommend avoiding, right? So I, I always recommend that as a leader, especially when you're gonna involve or engage in team activities, that you avoid using the question, why? Because it puts people on the defense. Instead, you use a question that begins with what, right? So instead of saying, why did you do such and such? You might ask, what made you arrive at the decision to do such and such? Um, other ones on this list, right? How does this make you feel? Tell me more. What else? How can I support you to be successful? All of these kinds of things help lower people's defenses, bring them out, and create that sort of dynamic uh, co-creation of trust that's necessary to uh, embark on some of the more difficult and challenging conversations. Um, the other thing I would recommend when you're going in as a leader to do team coaching or individual coaching is to give some breath, give a couple beats before asking the question. Oftentimes when I'm coaching leadership on advanced, advancing their own coaching skills, they tend to ask questions back to back. They don't give enough space between the questions for the person to really think deeply about what you've asked them to answer. So give it a beat, kind of give it a pause and get comfortable with being uncomfortable with that pause and with the silence. Because in that silence is when people have a chance to really do the kind of reflection that's necessary. And if you're asking a series of powerful questions and you're getting superficial responses such as, I don't know, or, you know, I'm not really sure, give them some time and restate the question. Oftentimes our, our knee-jerk reaction of I don't know or I'm not sure is a defense mechanism because we don't actually want to do the, the necessary thinking to dig in deeper and to think back and reflect on how we you know, engaged in a particular encounter. So these are some powerful questions and safe actions that you can use, um, whether you're doing individual coaching or coaching with your teams. I think this also supports kind of creating a culture of coaching and accountability and helpfulness when you ask questions around how can you help somebody to be supportive or you look at how you kind of took part in a co-created dynamic. And any of these questions are great to, you know, to spark conversation within a team when they're doing sort of a retrospect on you know, how they um, perhaps delivered a project or you know, if, if an initiative had failed, what is it that they could have done that was different? Or if something was successful, how can we replicate that in other areas of the organization? Coaching competencies and approach. So not everybody is, you know, uh, has the desire to go off and get certified as a coach like I did. It's time consuming, it's costly. And for most leaders, totally acceptable to just go and do an advanced coaching skills for leadership kind of training course in which you get sort of the, the foundational skills um, to, to sort of uplift your ability to coach organizations or your teams. So question for the audience, have how many of you have, and you can just put this in the, uh, the chat there, have experienced some level of coaching before? And how would you define coaching? How is it different from consulting or mentorship? And I've got the definition of coaching up top here, right? Partnering with clients in a thought-provoking and creative process that inspires them to maximize their personal and professional potential. That's the actual definition of coaching um, by the International Coaching Federation, um, which is the organization that I was certified through. Um, I think it's important to differentiate coaching from mentorship and coaching from therapy or coaching from consulting because it is different. It requires a different approach and a different methodology and a different framework for how you approach the interaction. So I'm going to go through that now. So whether or not you choose to go you know, through the process 
process of getting certified yourself. What I'll walk you through next is kind of how to set the foundation and what is necessary for you to have sort of a successful coaching interaction. And the first is, you know, just meeting ethical guidelines and professional standards. So me as a certified coach through ICF, we have our own ethical standards that we have to meet, right? But your organization may have other kind of compliance or regulatory issues as it relates to coaching. So if you're going to be offering your employees coaching um, or you're going to be offering your teams coaching, you may want to check with HR or somebody in your organization about, you know, what standards they have for uh, developing any kind of internal coaching program. The other is establishing a coaching agreement. And this isn't a contract. It's not a, it's not a piece of paper. It's the framework that you use to go through the coaching process. And all it is really is kind of understanding what is required in that specific coaching interaction, coming to agreement on what that uh, problem or challenge to solve is for that engagement. Oftentimes what happens with an inexperienced leader, um, when they try to go and coach somebody, the client will come and kind of word vomit a variety of different topics and issues that they want to address. And before they've got gotten cons or commitment on the topic to move forward with, they allow the client to move forward without coming to that agreement first, which makes it very difficult to assess whether or not at the end of the session, you've actually made progress or advanced towards the goal that was set forth at the beginning of the coaching agreement. So I recommend if you're going to coach somebody as an individual, or if you're going to coach somebody, you know, in the context of a team that you establish what that coaching agreement is. So start by saying, what is sort of the most important thing that you want to address today? And how will you know that you've achieved results by the end of the session? What does success look like for you? And if, you know, if you, if you need help sort of helping them refine, you can ask using those powerful questions. If you don't get clarity enough to move forward, I wouldn't recommend moving forward until you have that clarity is what else? Tell me more. And another follow-up to that is, what makes this issue so important to you? That can be a great question to get them thinking at a deeper level about what they want to achieve during that specific coaching interaction. It makes it a little bit more personal and it gets them out of the superficial. The next is about co-creating the relationship. So a lot of coaching is about vibe. It's about whether or not you really kind of relate to your coach and the coach relates to the client and that's subjective. It's personal. Um, you know, people find different coaches for different purposes or for different stages of their life or their personal or professional development, but who you are and how you choose to show up in a specific interaction as a leader, whether you're coaching an individual or a team is really important. And it's your responsibility as the leader to kind of set the tone. Like I said earlier about creating psychological safety, set the tone for the interaction, right? And so part of the job of the coach is to co-create what that relationship looks like. Um, establishing trust and intimacy with the client is important. Uh, the dynamics of that have changed, I think, since we're doing a lot of work remotely. It can be easier for people to kind of hide behind the veil of Zoom um, and not, you know, maybe not open open up as much as they would. So being creative in how you establish that trust and intimacy, especially remotely, is worth exploring. Um, and I think another way of doing it is expressing curiosity. So whenever I work with a new client, you know, the first pre-session that we have is really about building trust and rapport. It's about having genuine curiosity and appreciative inquiry for who they are as a person, what motivates them, um, you know, what keeps them up at night and understanding their sort of red issues and the same with teams, you know, spend time getting to know the team and getting to know the individual before you just dive into, uh, the coaching agreement. And it could be as simple as just getting to know them on a more personal level. Uh, the other is about establishing coaching presence. So I talked about kind of how you show up. Um, and I mean that everything from what you're wearing <laughs> to your body language, to your tone of voice, um, you know, coming across as authoritative and, you know, knowledgeable as, as a coach, but also approachable, right? You don't want to scare anybody off by being too bold um, in your initial encounter or interaction. So um, 
you know, being intentional about that interaction and establishing presence and being open to exploring your style. You know, I think it requires a certain amount of flexibility. I work with some C-level executives that are very, um, you know, very cut and dry and, and no BS. And then I work with others that want a softer, more humorous approach. Um, so it's really, again, about vibe and fit, but making sure that that you develop your own kind of coaching presence, I think is important and being flexible on adapting it based on your client's needs or your team's needs is important as well. Um, Karen, before you move on, there is a, yeah. a, a question about coaching. So I know um, we're still on this topic, so this may be appropriate. Um, someone asked, do you think you can have informal coaching or should it be formalized in a company? That's a great question question. So the organizations that I tend to work with see enough value in coaching becoming a part of their culture. And so they've made a heavy investment in creating that within, you know, the company culture and also in terms of their leadership development. Having it happen more organically and informally, I think is still great. Um, it's a way to establish the kinds of results that you want um, more organically throughout the organization. So, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be a formalized thing within your organization. Um, but if you see a need for it and you have the skills to do it, I would say there's not many drawbacks to, to doing it. Um, but if, you know, if you have a partner within HR or L and D and there are enough of you who see value in it, it's certainly worth exploring, um, you know, making it more of a presence or um, a part of the culture or the organization as a whole. That's a great question. All right. Um, so back to the sort of co uh, coaching competencies and approach, communicating effectively. This is a big one, right? So demonstrating active listening, powerful questioning, which I gave you some examples of before, and making sure that you're direct in your communication. Um, the importance of setting that coaching agreement from the beginning so that the session doesn't derail um, is an important one. The other way to look at this is as the coach or as the leader of the team or as an individual coach, it's your job to recognize that there might be multiple doors that your client has in front of them. Multiple doors that could lead down to many different pathways. It's your job or your responsibility to help that client or help that team choose which door to open, right? Which is gonna provide the most value uh, for the team or for the individual to walk through. How you determine that is based on active listening, right? Powerful questioning and direct communication. And to the last section is about sort of facilitating learning and results. So coaching ultimately is about generating results. It's about helping guide your client from getting to point A to point B in a more effective and efficient way, helping them self-actualize and uncover, you know, untapped talent or resources, you know, within them to see things from different dimensions, to achieve higher or better results, to develop better awareness, um, to develop better behaviors and better insights and better actions. So facilitating the learning and the results is sort of the tail end of the coaching agreement in that process. And you do that by creating awareness, designing actions, planning and goal setting, and then managing the progress and accountability. This may look differently to each of your clients, right? Every client's gonna have unique goals or needs for the coaching interaction, likewise with teams, but making sure that you have enough time at the end of your coaching interaction to make sure that the client has developed new awareness or the team has developed new awareness of their behaviors and how they participated in a co-created dynamic, designing actions. So what are they gonna do with the information they learned? You know, in this case, self-knowledge is not enough, right? We need to take action based on the circumstances that we're now more aware of. The last is, you know, planning and goal setting. So at the end of the session, when we get into designing action, 
I'll always ask my clients, okay, so where, you know, what do you want to do from here? Effectively, at the end of the session, you've set your goal for the next session, and how are you going to be accountable to those results? And what are you going to do to manage any obstacles that come up? Being clear about that, I think, is really um, important. So they're incentivized to take action and that you also have something to build on for the next session. Um, one question I get asked a lot now that I think about it is, do the, do the sessions have to relate to one another? It does if you're looking at designing a program for a team or an individual. It doesn't if you're just facilitating individual or team coaching in which in real time you want to address the specific needs of that team or that individual based on whatever they're facing you know, that week. Um, and there's no right or wrong answer to that, um, but that is one question I get a lot. All right, so team coaching activities. Um, I mentioned at the beginning, one that I think is really important is around creating psychological safety. So I run an exercise that I call, I feel safe when, and you can run this virtually or in person. You can do it simply by creating a Google slide and soliciting ideas from your team, or you can do it in a tool like Mural if you want to recreate the um, you know, flow chart things with the sticky notes on it, either way. But effectively, you're going to ask your team, what are the kinds of things that make you feel safe? And then you have them just pile on their ideas of what makes them feel safe. And at the end of that, you have a discussion around it. You know, how do people feel about what they're seeing? Are there any that really stick out to you as important to you or, you know, something maybe that somebody else shared that resonates with you? The activity itself is designed to facilitate better awareness of the team so that when they show up and have interactions, they can be thinking about, okay, these are the things that make my teammates feel safe when people listen fully, right? When there's no screaming, when it's okay to fail and they're gonna show up with a higher level of intentionality of creating a safe environment for the team to have interactions. Whenever I go in and I do team coaching for, for clients or companies, we'll run this exercise and then we'll use this slide that is generated at the head of each team interaction moving forward. Based on where the team is and their life cycle of maturity, um, some of them really need this as a reminder, right? Or they need it as a reminder also, not just because they're in a more immature state, it's because the team members are always, you know, coming in and out, right? So they might be swapping people in and out of the team, which resets the level of trust each time. So this is a good one to run and to remind people of, remind your teams of when they go to, you know, have subsequent meetings. Another activity that I like is based on the five dysfunctions of a uh, team, Patrick Lenciani, I'm sure you guys are familiar with it. Um, these sort of being the building blocks to establishing or eroding trust in team performance. So some of the characteristics of what teams need to embody to reach higher performance are these here on the right. So collective results, focused on accountability, commitment to decision-making, mining for that healthy conflict, and trusting one another. The foundation to all of this, I'm going to beat this horse to death, is trust and intentionality. If you're not, you know, creating opportunities to build trust, if you don't pay attention to it, it can very quickly and easily erode, and that's especially heightened in a virtual setting. So on the left here, you'll see things uh, that leaders need to focus on. So similar, but leaders really need to be focusing on collective results, confronting difficult issues, forcing clarity and closure, mining for conflict, and going first. So this activity that I run with leaders uh, can also be run with teams, and your focus you know, is going to be slightly different, and I'll show you what this looks like in just a moment. But if you're familiar with sort of the arc of a team, um, how teams reach higher performance and effectiveness in this chart here, 
you'll see that there's different kind of classifications for teams. And I think it's important that leaders be able to identify where their teams are on this chart and that teams are also able to identify where they are on this chart. The reason I suggest going through this activity to identify kind of where the leader is, where the leader sees the team and where the team sees themselves is often there is a disconnect between the two. Um, leaders may have a, a differing opinion on whether or not they see the team as a real team versus a potential team and, and likewise with the team themselves. And that's something that's important, I think, to kind of tease out um, and dig deeper on. Um, so this exercise, I will present the, the Lencioni um, five dysfunctions of teams. I show leaders what are the kind of capabilities and characteristics of a high performing leadership team. Likewise with the team themselves, I may show this chart and have them through a Zoom poll. Uh, if you're doing this remote, vote, you know, vote on where you think you are in this and then have a discussion on it. And the output of that discussion can be really telling. Um, so here is just an example of an output of that activity that we've run. And so what I have teams do is create agreements around the key sort of pillars to their success. And what it looks like for them is unique to each team. Um, and so this is an activity I ran with the leadership team, a C-level team, not long ago. And they came up with collectively, okay, what are the kinds of team agreements or commitments we need to make to each other to you know, build trust and reach higher performance and sustain that performance? And what do we need to do when we introduce new teammates into this dynamic? It was a powerful activity to get people aligned towards the kinds of behaviors that they and habits that they and ways of working that they ultimately need to demonstrate on a consistent basis. So the output of this activity is also something that I might remind the team of or remind the leaders of the next time that we meet. It sort of become the building blocks by which we engage um, on an ongoing basis. Another activity that I'll I'll run for teams is creating a team manifesto. And this is an opportunity for the team to look more deeply at how they operate, what their purpose is, what their vision is, right? And identifying behaviors that they want to move from or to, you know, to. Um, and for leaders to identify the things that they need to change, either about the way they work and engage with each other. Um, or the way that they're perhaps running the organization. So this is a great activity that doesn't have to be done just once, right? We might do it once and then we may amend it uh, on a quarterly basis. I recommend that teams continue to check in with these processes on an ongoing basis as part of their team governance to just have a check-in and to say, are the ways of working, are the team behaviors, are the team agreements, are those still in play? Are those still a priority or important to us for the health and well-being and the vibrance of our team? Or do we need to add or subtract anything, especially when you have new people starting? So the team manifesto is a great activity. And I, I've run this before over a multiple day session. And the first day I'll sometimes ask, why does this team exist? And I'll tell you, I get very different answers from everybody on the team, which says that there's a lack of alignment there. How does lack of alignment show up? It shows up in missed objectives, right? Missed deadlines, uh, confusion, miscommunication. It shows up, I'm sure you have other examples of how this manifests in your organization, but oftentimes leaders don't put enough emphasis and time into being sure that each team have the opportunity to create a shared vision and a unique value proposition. So creating this team manifesto can be a great way not just for your leadership teams, but your executional teams to align around a shared purpose and a shared vision. So as part of this exercise, folks will create, you know, their vision, their goals and objectives. So who they are, what their value proposition is, and that could be to the customer or it could be, 
you know, to an external customer or to an internal customer or somebody else within the organization. And then identifying the behaviors that are needed for success. And it could show up in choosing one behavior over another, or it could just show up as a list of behaviors that they want to demonstrate that will lead to success. And then in looking at that, what is the process that the team will go to go through, excuse me, uh, in working together or in terms of governance that will allow them the opportunity to practice putting these behaviors, these new ways of working and these habits in place, right? All of this, like I said, takes intentionality and practice. You know, you don't change habits or behaviors uh, overnight. And the last is just fun, you know, getting the team to create a logo and then signing the manifesto kind of makes it a little bit more personal and something that they can revisit and commit to. This activity can also be used as a way to communicate to other people outside of the leadership team or outside of that team, what is truly important to that group? What are they focused on? You know, how are they choosing to show up for each other? What are some of the practices and the principles and approaches that they're using to be successful? So you do this for one team, especially a high performing team, and you can use that to build out a model for success to replicate in other areas of the organization. All right, that was a lot of information. So I'm happy to take questions on some of the activities that I recommend you guys explore with your leaders or with your team. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that, Kieran. So I'm just going to go through the questions um, that are posted in the Q&A. Sure. And please, please, um, for everyone on, on today's webinar, feel free to type in your questions and, and we'll definitely get to them. So we have a question from Dion. What tools can be used for teams who are resistant to being coached? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, wow. Yeah, so it certainly helps, right? If you, if you have a team who has the desire to be coached and has the willingness to it and the open-mindedness to it. Um, and I always say that, you know, you can't make something important to somebody when it isn't, but if you present sort of the benefits to them of the experience of coaching and kind of give them a taste or a flavor of what it is in a way that's non-confrontational, right? That can be a point of entry. And you don't have to do all of it at once, right? You don't have to go completely overboard at 110% on day one. You can choose little tiny micro interactions with your people, right? Or with your teams to just kind of give them a flavor of what coaching is like. Simply by asking some of the powerful questions that I recommended can be a form of coaching without it being, you know, really intentional, right? Of course, there's also kind of education and training opportunities if you wanted to go so far as to share some resources with them, either off ICF's website uh, there's some great videos on YouTube that talk about sort of the benefits of coaching and what it is and who it's for and how people benefit from it. So that, that can be another way of doing it. Great, great. Um, we have a question. Uh, what do you do as a leader within a larger organizations when your team is aligned and moving in one direction, but there doesn't seem to be support from other units or divisions? Oh, that's a great one. So they might be like a runaway team Heading in, a, heading in a great direction, but the rest of the organization isn't particularly thrilled or aligned to it. Um, this is where change management and communications can become a useful approach or tool. And I always say, you know, when you're doing a retrospective with your team and you're looking at sort of what worked, what didn't, the question about what worked tends to not get focused on. And I, I think that should really sort of be the emphasis in many cases. And so if your team is doing something that is of value, then you as the leader should champion that in other areas of the organization and make it a part of the culture to talk about the wins and to talk about the successes. I would suggest coming together as a cross-functional leadership team to create opportunities to share more of that across the board, right? So not just the team that, you know, is doing great and, and running off and doing amazing things, but using a regular communication channel that showcases and demonstrates the successes that are happening in pockets of the organization that others might not be aware of 
and talking about how they're doing it. How are they achieving those results, right? Because it might be something that you may be able to relatively easily stand up or replicate in another area of the organization. You kind of got to get people excited about it and evangelize it. And everybody, especially right now, could use celebration of some success and some wins. Um, so that's, that's one idea. Great. Um, we have another question. At my company, trust is at an all time low. How do you re regain trust when it has been lost and the leader has let you down in a big way? Any suggestions for how you have that conversations with those above you in the organization? Yeah, uh, so oftentimes I'm brought into organizations to fix <laughs> this exact issue. We might go through all kinds of tactical things and all kinds of programmatic things that have failed or you know not gone as planned or didn't succeed in the way that uh, they expected. And at the root of it, it comes down to miscommunications that were based on lack of trust. How do you address it carefully <laughs> and with intentionality, right? So there are some exercises that you can go through to help create enough safety in which those issues that have taken place can be addressed. One way of doing that uh, that I did with the leadership team that was carrying around years of baggage, right? They were holding on to resentments in suitcases and dragging them around the organization. They were weighted down by this. And until they were able to move past it and let go of some of that, they were gonna continually be plagued by this issue of trust. So one of the activities I did with this executive team was an, um, was an activity around letting go. So let's, let's just get out on the table all of the offenses that have taken place that are weighing us down. And we're just gonna observe them from a third dimension. This is not personal, it's just for us to release some of that kind of negativity and the stuff that's holding us back. And we'll look at it, you know, not from a place of judgment, but from a place of empathy and appreciation and understanding for the struggle that everybody has gone through in letting this stuff go. And then we take those sticky notes, if you will, and we put them in a box and we say, from this point forward, what do each of us individually need to do and collectively as a team need to do to let go of these issues and to move past it? What are the things we need to say to each other? How do we need to treat each other? What are the kinds of like thoughts and behaviors that we need to exhibit to move past this, right? And are we willing to call each other on it when we see that we're reverting back to reacting from an emotional reactionary standpoint based on past hurt. A lot of this is just past hurt that needs healing. And to do that requires self-awareness and self-actualizing and a commitment from not just the individual, but the team to address it. And it's not easy. Trust is a difficult one to address. Um, but I think if you do it in a way that says, you know, I've observed that our team or our organization seems to be struggling based on this, that, or the other. And I would love to have the opportunity or permission for us to all address it together so that we can move to a healthier, more sustainable, higher performing state. That's great. Thank you. Sure. Um, for team coaching, do you avoid asking the opposite question, what makes you feel unsafe? Um, no, <laughs> I don't. Um, and I thought I had a slide about this. Let me go back and just see. Um, yeah, so I don't avoid that question. In fact, I ask both because I think it's important to ask the same sort of question in two different ways because some folks have a preference of looking at it in one way or the other. So. Um, and they may not draw the connection between, you know, what erodes trust versus what builds it. So that's another way of asking the same question. Uh, and this is an example of a list that was generated by 
a team that I coached um, previously. So I wouldn't avoid asking it the inverse because some other gems might come out that need to be put out in the open. Great, thank you. Um, another question, are, are you able to share a time when you had a team not working at their potential and walk us through the change process to high performing team, to a high performing team? What strategies work the best? Oh, okay. So the first one is just level setting. You know, what are we here to accomplish? And can we identify where we are in, you know, that sort of curve of team performance? And are we even aligned on it, <laughs> right? And do we even care to change it? That's another thing. Like I said, you know, you can't make something important to somebody when it isn't. You certainly can't make something important to an entire team if it isn't. So they have to have a willingness to want to address it. Um, the second is I create programs around it. So if we have certain performance measures that we need to adhere to or that we've committed to, we look at backtracking from that. What is it going to take to achieve those results based on the maturity of the team itself? And I would go through a series of activities, much like what I uh, ran you guys through, which is evaluating one, the level of awareness or self-awareness of members on the team, um, the psychological safety, or I feel safe when. I look at the ways of working. Are there any parts of the process that are broken that need to be readdressed in some way? What are the team behaviors that are persisting that are either causing resistance or, uh, you know, propelling them forward? So is there any, are there any habits, mindset issues, uh, behaviors, or things like that that need to be addressed? So I would run through a series of um, you know, activities around that. And, um, and then each week we would set performance goals for the team and we would create opportunities to practice. Creating opportunities to practice, I cannot stress enough how important that is. Um, you know, Self-knowledge is not enough, right? Like I said, it takes time to change your mindset, to change your behaviors, to change your habits and to practice new ways of working. So when you've identified sort of the three to five top, you know, things that the team may be struggling with, plot that out on a roadmap and give your team the autonomy um, on how to fulfill them and opportunities to practice. And then in feedback sessions, how did it go? What did we learn, right? I have a team that I'm coaching now uh, that identified five issues that are holding them back. And in those five issues that are holding them back, they chose one to focus on. And I built a program specific to tackling that one specific issue. And this was around breaking down silos within the organization. The organizational structure may stay the same, but how do we overcome the siloed ways of working and the siloed ways of thinking, right? So from there, we can develop a programmatic approach to, okay, th this is what we've committed to change. Now, how are we doing? And where are we giving ourselves opportunities to practice? And how are we holding each other accountable as teammates to um, demonstrating the behaviors that are necessary to affect that level of change? And how do we measure it as leaders? Great, great. So we have just a few more questions here. Um, for some people, the term coaching might carry some baggage. Are there um, other frames or terms that might be used in that case? Um, I, you know, I'm probably not a great person to ask on that because um, given the fact that I, I went through a formal certification program that has very defined, uh, very defined definition of coaching, I think that to call it anything other than it is, is kind of a disservice or discredit to the work that's actually being done. Um, but I can understand some people's sort of resistance to it. I think there again, it's just kind of how are you communicating um, the benefits and the value of coaching? And maybe you describe it in a way in which you're not necessarily using that word, but I still think it's important to um, differentiate it from mentorship, from advisory, right? Advisory work, from consulting, you know, and certainly from, from therapy. 
Great. Um, when flexibility and nimbleness um, and problem solving are key to succeed in challenging times, uh, how do you balance collaborative decision making with having to make necessary changes? Mm, this is a good one. Okay. So my school of thought on this is you have to know the culture of your organization and how they make decisions. And there may be certain ways of making decisions that are more culturally acceptable within your organization. And that may need to change. Um, building shared understanding is different than the process that you go through to make decisions, which is also different from the process that you go through to build consensus. All three of those are viable ways of achieving results, but you have to know when to use them, right? So I guess that's, that's kind of my advice is to really define what is necessary in this situation to achieve the results. What problem am I trying to solve is probably more important to ask before you get to the question of, now how do I drive the decision that needs to get made? Or, or is it more, another question I ask myself and I ask my clients a lot of times is, is it more important to be right or be aligned? <laughs> so once you kind of understand what the problem is that you're trying to solve, it can help you identify the appropriate uh, approach to take. Great, thank you. And what is the best way to approach a team or person that has more experience than you in other areas and is resistant to your coaching? Mm, that's a great one. Okay, so here's the beauty of coaching. And, and I, I felt the same way initially. I, I thought when I started out as a coach, you know, 15 years or so ago, and I was coaching executives that were, had more experience than I did, um, I thought, well, how, how are they going to receive my coaching? Or am I going to lack the confidence to do it? What I realized is I just have to be an expert in the framework. I do not have to be an expert in the content that the client brings me. And this is where I say it's important to differentiate the difference between strategy advising, mentoring, and coaching. If you can become an expert in the framework of providing the coaching agreement, right? The facilitation of guiding the client from developing better awareness to better results, you don't need to know and be a subject matter expert in the content. You need to be an expert in guiding them through a process of developing better awareness, better habits, better results, and better behavior. And you have to have confidence, right? <laughs> you get confidence by doing it <laughs> and practicing. Great, great. Um, I do have one question. And if there's any more questions that do pop up, please type them in. We have um, a, just a little bit of time for a few more, but I do have a question because um, you sure. mentioned this earlier in your presentation. Could you tell us what appreciative inquiry is? I mean, some of us may have heard of it before and, and you know, what it is and, and when is that particular approach effective in coaching? Sure. Um, so this goes back to some of the powerful questions. Um, appreciative inquiry is just sort of the approach or the act of uh, curiosity. <laughs> it's having curiosity and it's, it's asking questions not to get the person to better understand your point of view. It's seeking to understand before, you know, sort of speaking to be understood. Um, so the act of appreciative inquiry is approaching your client with sort of gratitude for the chance and sort of the honor of having the opportunity to get to know them and to be curious about, you know, kind of all aspects of who they are. When is it appropriate? I mean, I tell people this, leaders in particular all the time, whenever you are in a conversation with somebody, you're about to meet them, think of some of the questions you might ask to get to know them better and always be thinking of how how can I help support this person to be more successful, right? That goes kind of back to the, the attitude of helpfulness. If I am approaching my conversations with an attitude of helpfulness and appreciative inquiry and, um, you know, with that sort of tone in mind, uh, I'm likely going to learn more than if I'm approaching it from the point of view of I'm the expert in the room and I'm going to tell you 
you know, my point of view on, on whatever it is. Great. I think that is all of our questions. And right. so, you know, uh, this is great. And so thank you so much, Karen. It was a fantastic presentation with such great insights. So again, thank you. And I wanna thank everyone for joining us today in our Impact Insights webinar. Um, for our undergraduate students on the webinar, we're gonna pull up a slide right now so you can scan your CBA Advantage QR code. So it's gonna be up for just, uh, just a moment or so before we close. So get your phones out and scan it and get your points. Um, so again, thank you everyone. Our next Impact Insights webinar will be on Tuesday, November 17th, where we will pivot topics with our very own Professor um, Myla Bowie, who will focus on how we can no longer be silent about the taboo of mental health, especially during these times of the pandemic. So we look forward to seeing you then. It's been such a pleasure to have you all join us. And Karen, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. So insightful and, and so um, just awesome. So thank you everyone. Um, have a great rest of your evening and um, enjoy the day, enjoy the evening. Thank you.